I'm so sorry. You're fine. You're um, fine. My name is Dr. Kay Siebler. I am the de facto coordinator of the Let Lincoln Vote Anti-Discrimination Initiative Volunteers. Um, we are here today to present to you our verified voter signatures for meeting the requirements in the city code. Um, I'm going to talk a few minutes about our process. And I please ask for grace. I know that there's a five minute rule. We just don't want people cycling up here um, rather than have three or four people take the microphone. I'm just gonna speak a little bit longer than five minutes and I want um, that grace. Um, there are only gonna be two speakers after me. We are not going to cycle up to the microphone. There's only two speakers after me. Marie Barrett, who is a um, 20 year Navy veteran and a disabled veteran and the mother of a child with disabilities is going to speak, and Amos Sabatka, who is a trans man in our community and a, um, a civil servant is going to speak. So I just wanted to take a couple minutes to talk about the process because there's a lot of misinformation out there regarding what happened um, with this initiative. So when the city council voted in um, June to affirm the bigotry of the Nebraska the Family Alliance, we kicked into action. And our first stop was the Lancaster County Election Commission, and we talked to uh, Dave Shively. Dave Shively said, you need um, information on a municipal initiative, go see the city clerk. Um, they forward, he forwarded us to the city clerk's office, and um, we engaged with the city clerk's employees, including Mr. Christie. Everybody in the city's clerk's office was amazing. Um, they are conscientious and dedicated public servants, and they gave us a lot of good information. Mr. Christie forwarded us the link to the section of the municipal code that governs Lincoln Municipal Initiatives. But that's not the only place we went. We also went to the Secretary of State's election office, and the Secretary of State election office said to us, you must go to the city clerk's office. We, Lincoln is a charter city. The state election office does not govern the initiatives for charter cities. That is the city clerk's office. So we heard from two people, Dave Shively and the representatives at the Secretary of State Election Office, that it was the Lincoln Municipal Code that was governing this process for us. We dove into the Municipal Code. There were only two things in the Municipal Code that um, addressed petition forms and the actions of petitions. One is that you have to have on your petition form this paragraph right here, and that is in the municipal code, and we made sure to have that on our petition forms. The other rule regarding initiatives in Lincoln, Nebraska, is you have to make sure that every single one of your petitioners is in fact a Lincoln voter, and we made sure that that was true. We hit the round running, we were all volunteers circulating petitions throughout the city, sweating into our petition sheets, approaching voters. <laughs> Parks, restaurants, music events. Anyway, about three weeks left in our initiative, we received a very generous donation from a supporter. And when we did that, we decided that we were going to spend that money paying some of our volunteers. We have people in the chambers today who took time off work to circulate petitions. That's how much they cared about anti-discrimination issues. Rosie, who's in the house today, works two jobs. She works nine to five downtown, and she works weekends in a grocery store in this city, and she was taking time off work to collect signatures for the anti-discrimination initiative. So for volunteers like Rosie, we gave them a little money the last three weeks of the campaign. And when we did that, we printed new forms for those paid petitioners. We had four of them. Those paid petitioners had new forms and up in this corner, we wrote clear and free so the voter could see it, paid petitioner. We didn't have to do that. There's nothing in the city code that says you have to determine the difference between a paid petitioner and a volunteer petitioner. But we did it because we wanted to be honest with the voters. We wanted to be forthright with them and that we wanted them to see that clearly on the form. Well, you know, we collected over 11,000 signatures. Pretty amazing in that short period of time with nothing but volunteers. And we presented them to the city clerk and the city clerk then forwarded them to Dave Shively. Dave Shively took one look at our box and said, no red ink. And he consulted with the county attorney. I think the county attorney 
did not take a hot minute to ask Mr. Christie what the rules are for municipal initiatives, nor did that county attorney spend the time to talk to the state election officials. Because if he had, he would have heard that the municipal initiatives for a charter city reside in the Lincoln City Code. Well, what now? We are not going away. <laughs> this group of volunteers, this is a portion of who we are. These people are not going away until this is done. We are going to speak truth to the bigots, and we are going to say no. So we went back into the city code. What does the city code say about who verifies the signatures? Oh, it only says the signatures must be verified. I'm an English professor. I love passive verbs. It means that there's no active subject in that sentence. Who verifies them? So we got busy one more time. Knockity knock, knock, knock. Hello, Dave Shively. Can we please have a database of all the registered Lincoln voters? Absolutely. Come on down. Sign a piece of paper, pay $55. Here's your jump drive. 170,000 voter records. We solicited the help of very conscientious volunteers, attorneys and retired attorneys, civil servants and retired civil servants, educators and retired educators, 14 of us. We, we defined a protocol. Here's what you have to do to verify a signature. Put the database on a cloud. Everybody, divide up the forms. Get a magnifying glass. Caffeinate yourself. Meticulously go through each one of those signatures. Matching name and address. The name and address had to match. There's lots of voters in there who have different addresses. They're Lincoln voters, but they don't match address. People move, young people move particularly. We didn't count them. We only counted the voters whose name and address matched exactly on the form. When that name and address was matched, the verifier bolded it in the database, thereby accounting for duplicates. Goddess bless, Don Wesley signed the initiative three times. We love that level of support. <laughs> but we only counted him once. <laughs> we had a way of um, verifying voters that was initiating integrity and making sure that these voters today that we have verified are actual Lincoln voters. And we have over 9,100. We only needed 8,900. We have plenty, a surfeit amount of registered voters. So today, we are presenting these to you. These are our verified signatures. According to the city code, you now have a month once you take these signatures, you have a month. You can choose to act and you can choose to affirm the amendments that have been languishing for two and a half years, people, to protect active duty military, to protect veterans, to protect people who are cognitively and developmentally disabled. Yes, to protect LGBTQ people, to add hair discrimination under race, to add tribal affiliation under national origin. These people we talked to, this room, we could fill your evening with stories about the voters we encountered who are discriminated against every day because y'all fell down on your job. We talked to voters and they said over and over again, what were they thinking? What were they thinking? What was the city council thinking when they voted to uphold the bigotry of the Nebraska Family Alliance? And we would say, ah, uh ah, -uh. remember, the women stood strong. Dame Rabel, Tammy Ward, Sandra Washington, the women stood strong and said no to the bigots and no to the extremists. It was the men who folded like a house of cards. Voters don't understand that. They do not understand how that could happen. In Lincoln, Nebraska, where you have the supermajority on the council, gentlemen, what other time in history do you have five out of one, two, three, four, nine, 
Seven, six out of seven seats on the city council and you can't get this done with a mayor who is sympathetic. Mr. Bowers and Mr. Beckius, elders in the room, can you please rise if you can? If you've been working on this initiative, look at these people in the eye. You are sitting in your seat because of the work that they have been doing for 40 years. You are allowed the privilege to sit where you sit because these people gave you that power and privilege. And they're looking to you today and saying, what happened? How can the two out gay men on the council not get this done? Supermajority, sympathetic mayor, what's going on? Mr. Shelb, I deeply respect you as a civil servant. I do. But I was sitting right there. Thank you so much. I was sitting right there in June when you told us that you were taking your power and privilege as an elected official to vote for bigotry and extremism so that we, this good people of Lincoln, the good citizens of Lincoln, could not. You took that away from us. I don't understand the logic of that. I don't think a lot of people understand the logic of that, sir. Here we are today between the bigots and the extremists. And let me tell you a little bit about these extremists. They assaulted us. There's a 72-year-old volunteer in the audience today who was pushed down. Her signed petition sheets torn up because of these extremists. They're not the Nebraska Family Alliance folks. This is a different group. We had another volunteer who was pushed and manhandled and shoved so much, he nearly lost his footing. His signed petition sheets were destroyed. And in that most vulnerable moment when he thought that his physical safety was in danger, and it was, somebody took his picture, posted it on social media. Who is he? Where does he live? Where does he work? The subtext? Go get him. I don't know who these people think they are, but they are not leaders. Leaders do not harass and harangue. Leaders do not incite to violence. Leaders do not scream obscenities. Leaders do not attempt to bully and intimidate the good people who are volunteering their summer to circulate an anti-discrimination initiative. Is that who you seek counsel from? Mr. Bowers, is that who you look towards? Mr. Becky is for the important, serious policy that is the anti-discrimination amendments. I would hope not. I have one story I want to tell, but the, I do want to say the referendum, if you had read the referendum, this would have given you an easy out against voting for it because we know the Nebraska Family Alliance people, we know they're haters. We know that they hate LGBTQ people. Did, did you read this? 30 seconds to read their referendum and you would have seen that they also hate people with disabilities because they pull out disabilities as well as sexual orientation. Their referendum reads to repeal the code related to the definition of sexual orientation, gender identity. Yes, we know they're bigots. Disability people. These amendments cover cognitive and developmentally disabled people. Right now, the city code only covers a very narrow definition of physical disability. The new amendments cover cognitive and developmental disabilities. We're talking about autism. We're talking about various forms of mental retardation. We're talking about PTSD, ADHD, and serious brain injury. That's what the Nebraska Family Alliance also doesn't want to happen. That level of bigotry is eugenics level bigotry. That's what you voted to uphold. I'm going to tell one story. I'm going to tell one story. And it is about a little um, boy of Middle Eastern descent. And I was at July Jam, and I had my sign that said, sign the anti-discrimination initiative here. Family streaming in, picnic baskets, everything. And I was out there barking. It was a beautiful night. 
please sign Lincoln Voters, sign the Anti-Discrimination Initiative, protect active duty military veterans, cognitive and developmentally disabled people, LGBTQ friends, blah, blah, blah. This little boy came running over to me. He could not have been more than 10. And he said, my parents are immigrants, so they can't sign, but I'm a citizen and I can vote. And I said, oh, mighty soul. <laughs> I am so sorry, but you have to be 18 and registered to vote in the United States before you can sign this, but know this, you and I are both working against discrimination. Every time you speak up to a bully, you are fighting discrimination and together we are doing the same work and together we are making Lincoln a better place. And he shot out his hand. <laughs> and I took that hand and he said, you are a good person, thank you. And I said, I will di, I will di la, la shokran ala wajib, la shokran ala wajib, my child. My child, don't thank me for what is my duty. It is our duty to fight for the marginalized. It is our duty to fight for the maligned. It is our duty to fight for the people who are most vulnerable in this community. It is the least, the least you can do. It costs you nothing to vote for these amendments. And it means so much to so many. We spent our summer sweating into our petition forms, standing outside the DMV in the libraries, in the parks, in the music events, doing our duty. Because it matters, people. And we have come here today to ask you, will you do yours? OK, thank you very much. Are there any, uh, the next testifier would like to come forward? Okay, thank you very much. Someone else come forward and we would. This is Marie Barrett. Okay. And her son, Gregory. Welcome. Um, my son's only going to be up here for a short while. Okay. okay. Fine. He doesn't know. All right. He didn't know I was going to ask him to come. Uh. Okay. Thank you, Marie. Forgive me. You're fine. You are fine. Okay. Well, we can take him to the back yet after a quick sec. Is it okay, Gregory? Do you want to go with me? Yeah, one section. Okay. Okay. My son has a rare disability called arthrogryposis. Most of you have never heard of it or will never hear of it. Currently, he is one of all the children in Lincoln Public Schools with this disability. I've had to teach every teacher, every year, every school, every time he went to school about my son because they wanted to put him in a box. He has a bit of delayed because when he was younger, he couldn't walk, he couldn't talk, he couldn't write, he couldn't hold things. He still cannot hold many things with these arms. This hand is worse than the other. He's had multiple surgeries. He is a child of Shriners. We went to Children's Hospital where they did not know what in the world was wrong with him. Went through multiple surgeries trying to help him with his, his physical disability. And they almost bankrupt us. Marie, thanks. Could you get closer to the microphone? Thanks. Yeah, no, is that possible? You go. Yeah. Okay, we'll take you to the back. Okay. Thank you. I'm, yeah. And you if want you want me to sign this thing, if when you're done, you can and go ahead and. <sighs> it's okay. Take your time. He is my last child. He is my fifth. I have three by birth. My two first ones. Oh, and let me tell you about me. I'm a Navy vet. Twenty years, thirty-one days, with pride. Every day, I would say to this day, if I could go back in and serve, I would. But I made a promise to my two oldest boys because I was a single mom 
when I had to make my last duty station decision. And they said, Mom, I'd like to grow up with some friends from school. So I chose to move to Nebraska, where my sister went to Wesleyan and was still living here, still lives here. I chose to move to Nebraska because within my 16 years at that time, and visiting my sister, visiting other family members, being overseas, which I am actually from overseas, I was born in Jamaica and brought to the United States, and I am a U.S. citizen and proud of it. I told my sister that I was planning on moving to Nebraska. Why? Because of all the countries that I could retire to, all the countries that I've been to, all the cities and states that I have served at or visited, Lincoln, Nebraska, was the best of all of them, even going back to my own country. Why? Because they're good people. They don't discriminate. There's always work for you. And there will always be a kind, friendly face saying hi on the street, no matter if they know you or not. I have told that to many people since I've lived here. And they always said the same thing to me. You should go into politics. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Won't do that. <laughs> um, but one of the reasons why I mentioned I have five children is because he is my last of birth. I have one that is from my current husband um, who was born with autism, has Asperger's. He is on the uh, spectrum and has Asperger's. That young man was used by his mother, and I am sorry to say this is the truth, in the sense of getting help or, or sadness from other people so that she could go on and do whatever she wanted to without having to work. When we got full custody of that young man, he was getting D's and F's in Scott Middle School. And we worked with him, and he graduated with a 4 plus .0 GPA, Presidential Academic Award, perfect attendance. And this is a young man that couldn't look another person in the eye. And now he holds a full-time job for this county, probably in this building. I'm not exactly sure. He lives on his own, pays his own bills, and he has his own vehicle. But if it wasn't for the fact that we worked so hard to make him look normal, he would not have been able to get a job. He would not have been able to get a place of his own. He would have been living with us for the rest of his life because there is no protection for people with disabilities, especially ones that can't look you in the eye when they talk to you. Because you go to an interview, they expect you to look you in the, the, the eye and say, yes, I'm doing very well. I'm fine. How can I help your company? I will bring up the morale. He would not have been able to do that. We worked very hard with him to get him to that point, with my sister's assistant, who is also an educator or has her degree in special education. So she also helped. But one of the things that I don't understand is how you said it was OK to upgrade the wording, the verbiage. Just verbiage. You're not making any new rules or any new laws. This is already on the books. I couldn't understand it when I heard this. All you're doing is changing the verbiage so that it is more clear, so that those people that need the help can get it because they know there's a piece of paper, there's a, a, a statute that says that they can be helped. I am also a disabled veteran. I have seen where disabled veterans or veterans of any kind who couldn't make that last payment or whatever did not get any consideration or did not get consideration for an apartment because the landlord didn't want them to move in because you never know when they're going to leave. Well, that's with anybody, but that doesn't mean they stop renting to others. They look at veterans differently. They look at active duty differently. I know this for a fact as a person who was trying to get an apartment in another state as active duty. I gave them my information, and they told me that they could not give me the apartment because I could not guarantee that I would be there for a year. I had to go to my commanding officer. Now, I knew the rules. 
I knew the federal, federal statute that said that we have rights, but most military members don't. National Guards is big in, the, in, in Nebraska. They don't know this. National Guards does not get as much information as a, an active duty member does. Why? Because they're only part-time. I am sorry, I don't mean to take up your time, but I don't understand why you can't allow the verbiage of a statute that's already there to be updated. I just don't understand. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marie. Thank you. Okay. The next testifier, please. Come on down, sir. Ma'am. Madam Chairperson, members of the council, good afternoon. My name is Amos Sabatka, and I am a resident of Lincoln, Nebraska. I am here as a private citizen. The views expressed are my own. Why am I here? This has been an extremely difficult question to answer. I was happily living my life, working behind the scenes with the Fairness Lincoln Group, plugging away at getting the revisions passed, and then working to keep going once the revisions were halted prior to being rescinded. I'm here because I was told during that process, across all media formats and in person, that, this, that at this time, the trans community, all of a sudden, wasn't in favor of revisions to Title XI. Well, color me surprised, because I'm trans, and I'm for it. Okay? I privately emailed each one of you expressing my support for Title XI revisions and my concerns that you were getting one-sided view that did not represent everyone. I received responses from most of you, and I appreciate that. Thank you. Until Lincoln City Council rescinded the Title XI revisions, I was, out, I was not out as a trans man to my employer. I didn't want to go through that process again. Although I willingly did so in my 20s, I really didn't want to do it in my 50s. Because trust me, coming out isn't always a cakewalk. And most of the times it's unnecessary. I did come out to collect signatures for the Title XI initiative petition because someone else decided it was not time for me and other members of the LGBTQA community to receive legal protections. I came out because of the constant threat of losing the few protections I do have and the direct act of being denied those legal protections, again, was too much. I can't have these rights because, well, it's inconvenient right now. It's not time. I am no stranger to the fight for our civil rights, and from having difficult conversations over the years, I understand deeply the need to be in contact with and have dialogue with each other and those who oppose our cause. However, it's hard to not be frustrated when I'm told Lincoln needs more community conversations. More talk, which in the end has been to try and convince me why this time is not the right time instead of what we can do to get this ordinance passed right now. It's hard to not be frustrated when I'm told the trans community is against Title XI. Of the Lincoln's trans individuals I talked to while gathering signatures, my friends, and those I hadn't met yet, everyone signed the petition. Of course they did. They also want legal protection. Having them in place has been proven to increase our safety. So let me assure you there is no consensus among trans Lincolnites in favor of waiting. Yet for some, it's just not the right time. We need to wait. For the entire LGBTQA plus community, wait. For everyone who will benefit from extended civil rights protections, wait. It's hard to sit back and wait. Again, it's excruciating and frustrating to talk and not be heard. We talked and acted in 1982. We talked and acted against DOMA in 2000. We talked in 2012, 2017, 2020, and we are still talking in 2022. And still, our marginalized communities do not have the protections they so desperately need. We are so close. 
And today we are closer still. Closer to being acknowledged as having the same rights and protections to housing and employment as anyone. Whatever outcome you decide is not in my hands. I merely want you to know who I am and why this is so important. So again, why am I here? I'm here because as a transgender person, I have fewer protections than my counterparts in over 300 communities, including Omaha and all of the other Big Ten school communities. I am here, in short, because I exist. Thank you. Thank you, Amos, very much. Thank you. Are there other testifiers on this issue? Okay, okay, thank you. All right, thank you all for being here this evening. Um, yes, Councilman Raybould. Um, Madam Chair, I make a motion that we take these petitions under consideration. Would it entertain a second? I will second it. Okay. Oh, yes, Councilman McGinnis. I well, would like the opportunity to have some time to consult with our uh, city attorney on the legalities and the next steps. Yancey Christie, city attorney. If you could just, I think I heard your question, but if you could restate it. I'm just wondering, is there any legal legality changes that if we accept these petitions, are we accepting them as valid petitions or? I didn't. I know. That's what I'm trying to figure well, out. The, is I said to take these and accept these petitions under consideration, maybe clarify it a little bit more after reviewing with our city attorney on what are the next steps? I think it's fair to say that um, there are <clears throat> questions about the legality of what is happening. Um, by them bringing um, petitions um, and dropping it off to the um, clerk's office or the city council, um, I don't have a um, problem um, suggesting that the council still has to determine the sufficiency if it goes that route. And um, I think there are still further deliberations and considerations that need to happen. But I do not believe, and I know that this is inconsistent with what was stated, I do not believe that merely dropping off the petition starts the 30-day clock. Okay, so we're just going to, what does accept mean? What do we mean by accept the petitions? Well, I, I go back to, to take under consideration the petitions that have been presented to us uh, so that we could review with our city attorney on the next steps So, um, and consult with our attorney precisely to discuss the next steps. But the next step would for them to give them to the city clerk, correct? I think they've done that. I think they've. Oh, okay. I mean, I think whether they hand it to the there or here, I think it goes. They have presented it to the city clerk, and I think that's what they are trying to do. Yeah, they're today. just making sure that they're yes. present in our possession, correct? And I think it's also fair to say the city clerk doesn't turn away um, if someone, if they had done the same thing at the city clerk's office, the city clerk's office would accept the documents as they were brought. And I just want to add, I don't think any of us are well-versed in what the charter tells us and dictates our next steps, what they should be. And I think it would be a wonderful opportunity to take the time to review with our city attorney on what those next steps can and should be. Councilman Bowers. So if I understand correctly, like your amendment doesn't actually do anything, right? Because, I mean, the petitions are dropped off. We have the city attorney available to look through whatever this actually doesn't really commit anything so your right. amendment and doesn't really do anything well your it's motion. it's right it's not make, meant to make a decision today on 
what those next steps are because I'd like to consult with our city attorney so that he could uh, point out to us what options we have. When does that uh, clock that I heard referred to, when does that clock actually start? Based and on some of the items in the charter, but since none of us have had a real big opportunity to review what the charter tells us, it would be nice to, to be briefed on what our next steps will be. I'm still I, go ahead. No, I guess I'm still confused on like how the end result would be different even if we didn't do an amendment, right? Because we still have city law available. Uh, petitions got dropped off. Um, we're going to check with city law to see like what next steps are. And you're right to get briefed and to like figure out like what the legality of everything is. So I'm just trying to figure out like what's the end result versus doing amendment versus what is the end result of not doing an amendment? It's a, if motion. I may, it's not an amendment. It's oh, a, I'm, no, I'm sorry, it, motion. But, yeah, I understand. Yep. But I, from my point of view, if I may, a councilwoman Ray Bold, it's an official acknowledgement. And as a, sometimes it's appropriate. You can advise us differently to officially accept the petitions. Um, there's no action bound to that. It's just officially accepting them. And we have a motion and a second on the floor. Um, all the questions. Okay. We have a question. Um, Councilman Beckius has called the question for the vote. Um, Madam Clerk, would you please call the vote to accept, um, as posed by Councilwoman Raybould? Raybould. Yes. Chobe. No. Beckius. No. McGinnis. No. Bowers. No. Ward. Yes. Motion lost. Two to four. If they have been handled, one more testifier. <clears throat> All right. Um, so we still did receive the petitions. We They're here. We will the evaluate them over the next few days, right? Oh, I think we're moving on to another topic. So you had your opportunities to discuss, I think, Councilman. Okay. Just acknowledging. Well, we tried to do Justified. that formally, and you voted against I think, it. I think that would have started the clock, yes. 